you are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another Feast Day Quick Take on the Feast of, well, Blessed Martin de Pors, sort of, and St. Hubert, sort of, but mostly both and neither. If you look at the fine print on your Catholic calendar today, you'll see the word feria. Coming from the Latin words for free day, ferial days are like empty chairs in the liturgical year that different saints in different places usually fill as determined by bishops in various sees. So in the Americas, the feast of Blessed Martin de Pors, a Dominican from Peru who was beatified in the early 19th century, takes the seat today on our calendars, while St. Hubert, a French saint of the 8th century, will most likely be listed under Feria Day in Europe. The Roman martyrology, in fact, lists many feasts for every day of the year, but usually it's those with a strong cultus who are celebrated liturgically, and this, of course, varies from place to place. So I had to make a decision today. I absolutely love St. Martin de Pors, a saint of miracles, made especially dear by his humility and perfect obedience, and there are so many remarkable stories about his life. But back in September, on the Feast of St. Eustatius, I promised to catch up with St. Hubert today to make the distinction between these two saints, who are so often understandably confused. In a nutshell, St. Eustatius, whose feast day was September 20th, was a Roman centurion martyred at the Colosseum, together with his wife and children, early in the 2nd century. St. Hubert, on the other hand, was born in the mid-7th century in France, near the German border, and lived to a fruitful old age and died in peace. The reason they are confused, you might remember, is that they were both converted in the same unique and miraculous way, which I'll get into in just a minute. St. Hubert, the son of an ancient noble family that coincidentally or not coincidentally traced its lineage back to St. Eustatius, was distinguished by his personal charm and manliness, a favorite at the court of Theodoric III in Paris, who awarded him the title of Count of the Palace and deeded him lands in Metz, France, that, having extensive grounds for hunting, suited his particular renown as a huntsman. About the time St. Hubert relocated to Metz, around the year 682, he met and married the love of his life, Floriban, the daughter of Dagobert, another count of the realm. But their happiness was not to last long. Within a couple years of their marriage, Floriban died giving birth to their son, Floribert. St. Hubert was devastated, so much so that he became hermit-like, withdrawing from all court interaction and leaving his infant son to the care of nurses he took to the forests of the ardennes losing himself in the distraction of hunting barely pausing to take care of the necessities of life such as eating and bathing and pointedly dodging all social interactions too hubert lost track of the days and the weeks Almost wild in his grief, he shunned his obligations to his Catholic faith, loath to set foot in the company of those who would remind him of his lost happiness. And missing the forest for the trees, as they say, the poor man cried to heaven for answers and meaning as he obsessively tracked and hunted. And so the stuff of legend paints the picture, and um, Lisa embellishes, I hope you don't mind. In the chill of an early spring morning, the sun yet to find its way over the thick banks of trees that surrounded his spare camp, Hubert was awakened by the sound of large game nearby. His hunter's instinct immediately alert, he sprang soundlessly to his feet, shouldered his bow and quiver, and scanned the semi-darkness. And there, sure enough, in the deep shadows of a grove of tall knobby pines, he could just see the russet hindquarters of a massive deer moving with the grace of leisure through a patch of fern so tall that in the space of another step the animal disappeared with one last flick of its hoof, swallowed by the deep green shadows. 
and Hubert gave chase. Silent as a lynx, he followed his prey, sprinting around the tightly spaced trees, slipping through the ferns, listening all the while for the sound of the stag. For though he had not seen antlers, a leer so large could not have been a doe. All the better, a king of the forest with which to match his wits. With all his speed and power of lungs, Hubert chased, stumbling through the low-lying bog, frustrated that in the dawn's sparse glimmering of light he couldn't see to trace the stag's trail on the ground. Climbing a knoll that provided a limited view of the narrow valley, he stood silent and listened to all the expected sounds of a waking forest. The stirring of early birds, the coo of a dove, the faint sound of wind rustling through the pine needles overhead, and then unexpectedly the distinctive bugle of an elk rang out, echoing off the hills around him, sending a tingle of anticipation down his spine. Shrugging up his bow and arrows, Hubert turned toward the echo and charged down through the bog again and up toward the low shrub-covered ridge just west of where he'd stood. With the thoughtless instinct of habit, he breathed a prayer to his martyred ancestor, St. Eustatius, to aid him in his hunt. He scrambled to the top and stood, leaning against a gnarled pine tree, disciplining his breath to calm and his brain to focus. With the hunter's indispensable tool, his trained eye, Hubert scanned patiently for movement against the hill that continued to rise westward in front of him, up and up, ending at a craggy snag of boulders silhouetted against the purple-gray of the sky. And again the stag bellowed. Hubert strained and squinted to catch a glimpse of it. The stag was so near the breath of its call likened to stir the hair on his head and raise the goose flesh on his arms. Left to right he peered, up and down the hill, listening for the sound of its movement. He searched his memory for any other time he'd heard this call so early in the spring. Was it warning him off? It seemed to be alone, or perhaps its herd was over the ridge. The bugle sounded again, ahead of Hubert, and above him on the hill. Swiftly he moved to follow, almost blind in the low light, trying to follow the echo of the bugle which bounced off the rocks and ridges all around him. Lord, he said, forgetting their differences in his necessity, that I might see. And as though his words had opened a shutter, a shaft of sunlight cleared the tall pines behind him and shone on the stag, a king of the Ardennes, stark against the boulders at the top of the crag. So bright was the light of the dawn that it was as if every hair of its fur stood individually drawn over its muscled chest and flank. Neck arched proudly, it stood like a statue, meeting the eye of St. Hubert, who in awe could not move, could not tear away his gaze, until the stag shook its great head and with an upward jerk lifted its muzzle. And then Hubert saw its tremendous rack, too many points to count. But all thought of counting ceased when he saw what stood on the coronet between the antlers. Unbelievably, no, it, it couldn't be, he rubbed his eyes and looked again, and his eyes had not deceived him. Clearly lit by the sunlight, there stood the image of the cross, and upon it the crucified Lord. And from Christ's holy face glowed a light brighter than the rays of the rising sun, a light that crossed to Hubert, and piercing his sad and lonely heart, opened his eyes, and through his suffering, St. Hubert could, for the first time in his life, see. Now legend has it that this miracle occurred on the morning of Good Friday. In some versions of the legend, St. Hubert hears a voice emanating from the crucifix which says, Hubert, unless thou turnest to the Lord and leadest a holy life, thou shalt quickly go down into hell. At this extraordinary occurrence, St. Hubert prostrates himself, and after asking, Lord, what wouldst thou have me do? He is told, Go and seek Lambert, and he will instruct you. It's a matter of public record that St. Hubert did indeed set out for Liege within a couple years of his wife's death, where he met up with Bishop Lambert, who became his spiritual director. 
renouncing all his wealth and properties and surrendering his noble birthright to his younger brother Odo, whom he made guardian of his infant son, St. Hubert then studied for the priesthood and was ordained, ultimately rising to the bishopric of Liege, succeeding Bishop Lambert. Hubert was well known in his time for his kindness to the poor and his eloquence as a preacher and teacher. He was also remarkable for his fasting and assiduous prayer, and it is by the fruits of these exercises, to be sure, that he converted the pagans of the extensive Ardennes forest and the nearby regions. The great hunter of the Ardennes had, by the grace of God, cooperated with the will of God to become a hunter of souls. St. Hubert died of natural causes in 727, and his son, Floribert, who had followed in his father's priestly vocation, later succeeded St. Hubert as bishop. St. Hubert is the patron saint of hunters and of archers, as you might have already guessed. Throughout Europe, especially, you can find today many hunting clubs named in his honor. He's also the patron saint of knights, a patronage which stretches back to the Crusades and which spurred at least two royal orders, or Catholic dynastic orders, of knighthood. One of these orders, founded in 1445, is still in existence today no longer serving the purpose of support for knights engaged against the Turks, though, unfortunately. The International Order of St. Hubertus calls itself a, quote, worldwide organization and knightly order of hunters and wildlife conservationists that promotes traditional hunting ethics and practices, end quote. So, not as impressive as saving Christendom from the Mohammedan scourge, but still a good cause, I guess. Interestingly, also going all the way back to medieval times, St. Hubert somehow became connected with the deadly rabies virus. A sacramental known as St. Hubert's Key was for centuries the only recourse for those exposed to hydrophobia. A piece of metal similar to a key or a large nail with a flat decorative head, this sacramental was blessed by a priest, heated, and pressed onto the animal bite as an antidote. Did it work, you ask? Well, besides the efficacy of the blessing, which invoked the intercession of St. Hubert, there are modern-day scientists who have conjectured that the method might actually have worked in some cases, as the heated key, if applied immediately, may have cauterized and sterilized the wound, thus effectively killing the rabies virus. Also of mysterious origin are St. Hubert's patronages of opticians, mathematicians, and chicken roasters. I can't imagine how his name ended up being invoked for chicken roasting, but that's one thing you've got to love about our faith. There's no consideration too small or too off the wall for the church to address. And there is no petition that any one of the saints in heaven would ignore because it didn't fall under the umbrella of their, quote, specialties. For instance, though it's not officially suggested in St. Hubert's list of patronages, wouldn't you think he'd have a particular sympathy for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one, especially a spouse? And he might be just the saint to turn to when hobbies and distractions get the better of us, a common problem in our day. Who better to help us keep our aim focused on the right target than the patron saint of hunters who aimed for a deer and found God instead? St. Hubert, help us keep our eyes on heaven. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints.